I have just released the third in a series of articles on Linux loadable kernel module development for an embedded Linux device such as the BeagleBone. This video provides a summary demonstration of the three example loadable kernel modules that are developed in the third written article. The first two articles provide the groundwork for the third article. A loadable kernel module or LKM is a mechanism for adding code to or removing code from the Linux kernel at runtime. They are ideal for device drivers enabling the kernel to communicate with the hardware without it having to know how the hardware works. The alternative to LKMs would be to build the code for each and every driver into the Linux kernel. We can write our own LKMs that can be loaded and unloaded from the Linux kernel at runtime. This is a complex topic that will take time to work through. It is not possible to cover the detailed content in a video. Therefore, I've broken the discussion up over a number of written articles, each providing a practical example and outcome. The series of articles can be found on my blog site, www.derekmalloy.ie. As I said, this video demonstrates the modules that are developed in the series of articles in action. The three examples are as follows. The first example toggles an LED when a button is pressed. The second provides an enhanced GPIO driver for handling push buttons. It has sysfs bindings and can be controlled from Linux user space. The third provides an enhanced GPIO driver for handling LEDs. It uses kernel threads to perform this task efficiently and has sysfs bindings to allow the device to be controlled from Linux user space. There are easier ways to do all of those tasks in the Linux user space or by using the PRUI CSS on the BeagleBone. However, this is an educational exercise that aims to perform these tasks in the Linux kernel space, not Linux user space. All of the code is available on the GitHub repository for my book, Exploring BeagleBone, and it is freely accessible to all. You can download the code using git clone https colon slash slash github.com slash Derek Malloy slash exploring bb dot git. The important code is in the directory exploring bb slash extras slash kernel. You can build the example using the build script by typing dot slash build, but you will also need to have installed the Linux headers on your BeagleBone first. That step is covered in the first article. The same circuit is used for each of the three examples. It consists of a normally open momentary push button that is connected to pin 27 on the P9 header. It's configured to have an internal pull-down resistor enabled. The LED is connected to the BeagleBone using a BS270 FET to protect pin 23 on the P9 header. There is no need for a device tree overlay as this is the default configuration of the pins on the BeagleBone. So the first example aims to light an LED when a button is pressed. It doesn't sound too bad, but it is a surprisingly difficult task in Linux kernel space. To perform this task, the concept of kernel interrupts is introduced and the use of the library of code that can be accessed using the Linux GPIO.h include. This example is also used to test the interrupt performance on the BeagleBone. The first example is in the GPIO test directory. We can build this by typing make. And you'll see that there's a new module in the directory. Uh, modules have the extension .ko. We can then load this module, but before that, I'm gonna open up a second terminal and I'm gonna use this as, this is in super user permissions, tail minus f kern dot log. So what that does is it allows us to watch the kernel logs to see what's happening as the module is loaded and unloaded. So now we can load this module. sudo ins mod. And you'll see straight away that we get a log on the kernel window, we, on, the, on the kernel logs, we get that the module has loaded and the current state is this. We can also see that the IRQ for our test example is 243. Then in our circuit, you'll see that the LED has turned on. It was off at, onto this point. This example simply, when you press the button, it turns on and off the LED. You can also see that at the exact same time, it's generating an interrupt in the kernel log window. Now, we're just doing that 
giving that output here just to make it very clear what's happening uh, inside in the module. So I've brought up the scope so we can check the performance when the debounce is enabled on the button. I have my finger on the button and using my other hand um, I'm triggering the oscilloscope into single step mode so we can put in single step and press the button and you can see that there is a delay of in or around 300 microseconds with this approach and you can see that the LED toggles. Um, if we do it again just to see if it's consistent not much difference obviously the state inverts because it's going off to on to on to off um, so in the next case just short of 300 it's more again just under 300 microseconds so the performance with the debounce enabled gives us a step change of around 300 microseconds if we build this module with the debounce disabled you'll see that we get more errors when we press the button uh, you know sometimes uh, we get a single click will result in two state changes like there um, but we'll see that the performance is a lot better in terms of the scope so if we run a single scope step single and we press the button you'll see that we're now down to I've changed the scale on the scope so we're seeing it's about 25 microseconds run again Inversion this time, you'll see it's below 20 microseconds. Again, below 20 microseconds. So it varies in tests, I found it varies between about 15 microseconds and 25 microseconds. So that's the performance that it takes, the time it takes for the button interrupt to be received in Linux by the kernel and for it to trigger an event which is to change the state, the GPIO state of the LED. Just while this module is running, we can we can perform an LS mod and see that the module is there, and we can get information about it. You see, it shows us information about the module, and it would show us any kernel parameters. And finally, just to show that this is actually um, that there's a re there's a registered interrupt, we can more slash proc slash interrupt and we should see that there's an interrupt here yeah down here right interrupt number 243 GPIO EE -E, uh, EBB GPIO handler which is the name of our of our uh, um, handler for our interrupt and finally when we're finished we can unload the module by sudo or mmod um, GPIO test and that unloads the module from from the kernel the second example is an enhanced GPIO button driver. This example uses uh, K objects and the SysF and SysFS to allow us to build our own device driver for, for using buttons. The source code is described within the article, but we'll just have a look here to see how it actually works. Importantly, this module allows you to send data to and from um, kernel space. So at the moment, we have no modules loaded. So we can go down to direct directory for this, which is button. Again, make it in the same way. Um, and we can load it. Okay, so the button is loaded. And you'll see that on the circuit, it does pretty much the same thing. It just toggles the button as before. The important thing with this module is that, well, as well, well, let's just want do one thing first. We can also do, so, um, LS mod, button. Uh, we can also define certain parameters when we're starting this module up. So we could start up this module by saying we want a rising edge form or a falling edge form. It's currently in rising edge mode, which is default. It's also set by default to use GPIO 115 for the button and GPIO 49 for the LED. That can be changed too uh, as the module is loaded. Um, we'll see that the impact of this, just clear screen again, is we can go back to cd slash sys and you'll see that there's a directory now um, and it's probably not best practice but I've placed everything in the EBB directory just off slash sys 
So we can go into EBB and you can see that there's now a GPIO 115 and that's that's created by this module code dynamically. So if we change the GPIO to be 116, well then that number will change as well. We can go into this directory and you'll see that this defines the attributes that I've defined against this driver. One of them is the number of presses that the button has had. So you can see in the logs, we've pressed the button four times. So if we cat the number of presses, you'll see that it's currently four. I'll press it a few more times. It's currently debounced. And you can see that if we cat the number of presses again, we've now had nine presses. As well as that, we can find out if the LED is on or off. Currently it's off. Cat LED on, it's off. If we press it once more, LED is on. It shows us that the LED is on, as in the, um, on the circuit. We can also find the last time that the, the button was pressed. Um, the last time. So it was pressed at 4.21 and 8 seconds. The, the date at the moment in, in this in the video is, well, it's 5.21. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not adjusting for time zone at the moment here in this program at all. So you can see the 21.29. Um, it also shows the difference in time between the last two presses. So if we cat diff time, there's been, a, there's, there was 15 seconds. If I press it again, and then press it once more. You see that was about just over a second. Yeah, very close to a second. That shows us the time in seconds and then in nanoseconds to, to, to that level of precision. And the usefulness of this is that because it's a kernel module, there isn't a huge load in terms of the, in terms of the module because it's, it's, it's only being executed when it's required. We can also do some other things with this as well. Not only can we read values, we can write values. For example, we cat the number of presses again. You see it's 12 at the moment. There's nothing to stop us from echoing zero to the number of presses. And if we cat the number of presses, you'll see it's now zero and it's ready to start again. So we have full access to set the state of the module from user space. This allows us with any application in any programming language that uses SysFS to change the properties of the module and the interaction with the module. We, you know, I've also added in is debounce enabled as part of this, which allows us to turn on and off debouncing. Just one last thing, don't unload the module while you're inside the sys ebb gpio direct, uh, 115 directory because if you perform an ls, obviously the directory has disappeared, so that will result in a kernel panic. Uh, which isn't good. So if we change back to our directory, Beaglebone, uh, extras, kernel, um, button, we can then remove the module. Okay, and that worked perfectly. The third example is an enhanced LED GPIO driver. This example is used to flash an LED, which allows us to investigate the use of kernel treads or K-treads. Essentially, the kernel flashes the LED at a fixed frequency and using sysfs we can modify this value from within kernel within user space. So to do this, we can go to our directory. It's just in the LED directory. And you'll see that the module is there. We can build it and it's already exists there. So we can just load it directly. So just check that there's no other modules loaded. No. Load the module. So once the module is loaded, you can see out in the circuit that it begins to flash at a period of about one second. And uh, we've, that means we've got a tread running on our, our machine that allows us to do that. Uh, that tread actually has the name EBB in capital. So we can actually see this if we do um, PSAUX graph LED. You can see that the tread is there. It's using LED flash tread, it's one letter too long. It's running as root, PID 2877, and you can see it's using 0% of CPU. So it's not a very onerous task. Um, again, we've sysfs bindings for this. And again, I've put it in the probably inappropriate directory of EBB, sysEBB. Uh, this time it appears as LED 49. And you can see that like the GPIO example, all I have is a blink period and a mode, but these are attributes that I can set 
from within user space. So we can uh, cat the mode, it's in flash mode, and cat the blink period, which is 1000 milliseconds or one second. So if we want to change the, the, the period, we can just echo, for example, um, 200. I don't know how much the camera is going to pick up. So you can see that now it's flashing at about a fifth of a second um, each time. Uh, we can change the mode. To, we, can, we can echo uh, on to the mode, which switches the LED to on mode, off. And we can switch it back to flash mode. Okay, and it, it works fine. It is flashing with a very regular uh, period. It may not appear that beautiful aliasing on the camera. Uh, the camera's capturing at 25 frames a second. So it's possible that there's aliasing problems going on there. But it is flashing with a very clear and, and even period. And I'll show that in the scope in a second. We can go higher, we can go right down to a period of, of 10. Um, and I don't know if it's gonna show up or what it's gonna look like now. It just looks like it's on, um, um, but it's working correctly. Um, if we just change that to 100 just to, so, for, so we can pull up in the scope. So hopefully you should see a bit of a flash again with aliasing, but it's a fairly regular signal. If I pull up the scope, um, should run this. 10 microseconds of division, that's a bit short. Change it to, what am I at, 120 milliseconds. Um, so you can see it's shifting a little bit, uh, go up to 100 milliseconds. And you can see that that's a, a nice regular um, period. It shifted a little bit. It's not exactly uh, one, you know, it's not exactly flash with a regular period, but it's, um, it's very close to it. So again, that's running, even if I change that to a lower frequency, maybe I'll do that just for a second. Um, what's the best I can go? I think the lowest I can go is to two. Um, bring that back up in the scope. Um, down a bit. You can see it's quite regular. Um, there's not too many issues there. So let's see what effect that has on the processor. Well, if I, if I you'll see that it's still running uh, pretty much at 0%, less than 0%. Every so often you'd see 0 0.1. Um, so that shows that the, you know, as a, as a driver for the, an LED or a, a, any sort of signal, digital signal, you can use it from within kernel space. And because the kernel has priority over user space, uh, it does mean that you do get better um, switching values. If you wanna go much higher than this, really you should be using the PRU. If you start to create a kernel thread that you know, requires nearly 100% of CPU, well then Linux isn't gonna perform very well. So it's important that you, 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 you even temper your expectations in terms of what's possible in writing code for kernel space. So hopefully those three examples provide you with a starting point by which you can begin to write your own loadable module code that can interact with hardware on an embedded Linux device such as the BeagleBone. It wasn't possible to describe the code in a video alone, so I've made the description available on my blog site at www.derekmalloy.ie. It is a complex topic but it is really interesting to see how you can get under the hood in Linux and achieve even better control over these powerful embedded Linux devices. Thanks for watching.